So Patty, I'm really excited about our conversation today with Katie and Kyle from MPI talking about W-2 employees, when are they the right fit, both from an administrative perspective and from a sales perspective. Yeah, and I really appreciated how they drilled down on, you know, what are the really the considerations of, you know, from the from the uh, ISO perspective as well as from the sales agent perspective. And, you know, there's a lot of things that go into that. And I think as we discussed during the podcast, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if you're a good sales agent and, uh, you know, you're really drilling up business, but you need help, right, might be time to consider a W-2. On yep. the other hand, if uh, you need motivation, might be time to consider being a W-2, right, James? Yeah, absolutely. Either way, you, everybody needs structure. If you want to be really successful and structure comes in the form of W-2 as a general rule from, from an organizational perspective. And then talk to us about the insider's report and questions from the field, which both kind of went together today. Right. They went together because we're both talking about uh, the issues related to PACs and PACs terminals. Um, I encourage you to, to listen all the way through and get the latest on that, as well as some really uh, insightful uh, advice from James on, on where to where to go um, in this current environment. Yep. And uh, our uh, our podcast today is uh, brought to you by NMI. Go to NMI.com or better yet, CC Sales Pro dot com slash nmi fill out a little form and uh learn about nmi and how awesome. they can help with their gateway services good stuff well let's dive right into our interview today let's do it welcome to the merchant sales podcast hey everybody so patty and i today are joined by two people so one of them is a returning guest we have kyle morgan the ceo and head of product uh from mpi how are you doing today kyle good Awesome. Um, and then we have Good Katie to see you again. Yeah, there you go. Um, we have Katie as well. Uh, Katie is the director of sales at MPI. How are you doing today, Katie? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Great um, to have you. Well, we are really excited to have this conversation. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk even through like the Facebook groups online and different things like that about, you know, W-2 sales positions in the industry. You know, does it even make sense? You know, when do you do this? Who's the right fit for this? How do you structure right. the compensation so you don't lose a fortune on it? Um, and so I'm really excited to have that conversation. And so before we dive into that, though, um, Katie, I want to start with you. I know you have not been on the podcast. And so give our audience a little bit of a background. You know, how did you get into this crazy industry that we're in? Um, and then talk to us a little bit about framing this conversation. Why is this an important conversation? Why do ISOs need to be thinking about, you know, this W-2 model? Yeah, absolutely. So I blame Kyle for getting me into the industry. Um, I've actually- always got to blame somebody. <laughs> yeah, he got me, uh, he got me into the siren song of payments. Um, we were uh, actually childhood friends and uh, friends in college when he started um, in the payments industry. And uh, I was actually the, the third employee of the company. So the second person that he hired is a W-2 employee. And I started out as uh, support and administration. It was him and another salesperson. And so we kind of started the foundation of, of our ISO based on that work that the three of us did. Um, and I worked for Kyle for a number of years for support and administration. Um, I moved out to LA for about six and a half years and I worked for a small ISO out there and then uh, a larger ISO for the integrated payment space before coming back to Kyle about four years ago. So I've been in payments for about 15 years now and went the admin and support path in the first part of my career and then transitioned into more of a sales path in the second part of it. So once you got the once you got the uh, the bug for payments processing and ISO sales, you just there was no turning back, huh? <laughs> I, I know this is going to sound really nerdy, but I, I really just enjoy payment so much. No, I mean, you're, you're talking to the woman who calls herself the payments maven of the fourth estate. So <laughs> <laughs> I totally get it. I think payments is just a really interesting subject, you know, really and it, that's always changing. That's keeps it, you know, keeps it alive. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So, so Kyle, let's go over to you. And, and I really have kind of a two part question for you to kind of start this conversation off. Okay. So I have a broad question and then a specific one, maybe you could answer both. So first of all, just again, continuing to frame this conversation a bit, right? Like, as you know, most of our audience is like, you know, independent ISO owners that used to be 1099 agents or they're 1099 agents. And they're like, W2, like what, <laughs> you know? So Help us understand why you felt like that was an, a model to go with early on 
Um, and then let's once you answer that, let's transition into a really a more of a specific question of talking about some of the traps and specifically things like employer taxes and kind of some of these traps of like when you're modeling this out and you're trying to figure out, is this going to make sense for my company? Some of that. So I know that was a lot, but if you could kind of yeah. answer both of those, that would be great. So um, the W-2 model, we kind of just grew into. So, you know, as an ISO agent in the beginning, I was 1099. I uh, have my own company. We had built up, I don't know, 50 or $60,000 in residuals. We got our first bank contract. Um, nine branch bank here in Delaware, got the bank on board. I was going into what would have been my fourth year of school. I did many years of school because I didn't go to the standard path, but my fourth year of school, recession had just hit, bank chose us, got this bank partner. They gave me 17 deals in the first month. So out of necessity, I had to hire some help. Right. Um, so I ended up hiring my roommate from college at the time. Him and I were in the uh, you know basement of our beach house. So I had to give him an hourly position. I sure. had to give him a regular W-2 role. Um, he was processing apps and downloading terminals, and I was out there just getting signatures done. Um, and so as it progressed, and we kept getting bigger and got more partners and more leads, and, and, and organically, that person moved into a sales role. So the W-2 kind of model just transitioned by organic. Um, and then Katie came on a little bit later, you know, we started going, okay, we need somebody to do these terminal downloads. And, you know, him and I were selling heavily. So we did kind of a, just an organic transition to W2. Um, it wasn't on purpose. It wasn't like a goal, but right. it worked from there. And then we just kept duplicating that model over and over right. again. Yep. Um, so that was, that was kind of the, the basis behind it. Um, right. Again, I think a lot of things you do in business, you don't do on purpose. You just kind of Right. Fall into it. Right. And if I could, yeah. And if I could interject there a little bit, Kyle, you know, one of the things I hear you saying that I think is very important for people to understand is that there are times where you as a 1099 sales professional or an ISO owner, you're creating some kind of value. You're making something happen. In your case, it was closing a bank uh, referral relationship where you need to have the structure and the accountability to ensure that this project is handled correctly. And unfortunately, if you have a 1099 person running around out there, you don't maybe they're that. fantastic. Maybe they're yeah. watching Netflix when, and ignoring their phone, but you really don't have any legal or, uh, you know, cultural control over that. So, you know, I think that's, that's, a, that's a really important thing. I mean, do you think that that kind of weighs on it as far as it's like, I think as ISO start to get these opportunities that come along where it's like, you know, and so many 1099s I talk to you run into this, Kyle. It's like, seriously, I'm like, I talked yeah. to him for five seconds and I'm like, why haven't you hired someone? You yeah. know, they're like, oh, I just closed the, the association for my state and I'm getting 13 calls a day. And I'm thinking I want to hire some 1099 reps. And I'm like, you're insane. Yeah. You're crazy. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> like, don't do that, right? So, yeah. Well, so, yeah. And I, I think that that's why the W2 model really fit us from the beginning. And really, as we've grown as a company, and we have 1099s that, Right. are good examples of high residual 1099s that go after specific vertical markets. They're high rev share. They're right. just, you know, set and maintain. Yep. But with a bank partner, with a state association, you have to control that experience. And if your goal as an ISO is to engage with lead sourcing that involves a partnership where you have to control that experience, right. mm -hmm. W-2 is a natural option for that. Yep. Okay, so now that we've kind of established a little bit of the rationale, right? Of like, okay, why would we consider W-2? So now, Kyle, let's go back to this trap. So talk about, you're, you're projecting, you're trying to figure out, what do I pay these people? Am I going to make money? Talk about some of the traps, specifically I know with employer uh, taxes is like a really big one. So, so talk to us about that a bit. Yeah, so that was the biggest probably learning curve from back then is, okay, I'm mm -hmm. going to, you know, and this, is, and this is how every kind of, I've talked to a few ISO agents. So like, I'm hiring my first sales guy and you know, they're, they're local to us and we, we collaborate, you know, they're, they're, they're within my backyard, but again, you know, we call them frenemies. You know what I mean? We all work together because, right. yeah. you know, we're up against the big banks and whatever. So as I said, we work together, you know, and the, and the first thing to kind of talk about is one, you know, obviously they're not going to be the entrepreneur. They're going to be the sales guy. So treat them like a salesperson. Right. And then two, always look at the commission structure and don't go, is this the commission structure? You as the entrepreneur, you as the original 1099 guy, I had to have 70%. I had to have these bin rates and this, this other fee. So right. what normally happens is these guys go and go, okay, if I'm going to get a me, 
I've got to offer them what I would want. You're like, right. okay, well, let's step back. <laughs> you, right. One, you're giving them a W-2 role. And two, there's taxes associated with that. And people go, yeah, yeah, yeah. They take 30% of their paycheck. It's like, well, no. Not all that. <laughs> not all that. So now they don't, they don't understand that, oh, there's a FICO match. There's a FUDA match. There's a mm -hmm. Social Security match. So ultimately, general rule is 18% of whatever you pay. So you pay someone $100. Yeah, they take home a $70 paycheck. But you had to give them $118 out of your pocket because 18 of that 100 went to the government. <laughs> Right. Um, so general rule, I always tell people is round it up to 20, you know what I mean? And make that as part of your decision. So we'll use credit card terminals as a real simple example. Say you're going to give everybody, okay, here's your cost for a PAX S80. Anything you mark up above that, I'm going to give you hundred percent. Well, that's a bad mistake because now they sell it for $200 over. Well, it's going to cost you $240 to give them the 200. Right. So you've got to make sure. So, okay, I'm gonna give you 70% over. Same rule, what's 20% of 70? That's 84%. Okay, so am I okay living with a 16% margin on everything over cost? Did I right. build enough into the backside? And same thing on everything else. Right. The credit card processing residuals, if you're giving them 80%, well, no, you're actually giving them 96% because right. you're paying the backside of the taxes. Right. Yep. Are you right. really gonna work that hard for a 4% rev share as the owner of an ISA? Right. That doesn't right. make sense. Right. So those right. are kind of that, that that's the first trap that sure. I think a lot of people get into because they treat their W-2s as right. if they were a 1099 yeah. split and all that stuff. And you just can't do it. It just doesn't right. mathematically make sense. And I right. think one other side to this to make sure to clarify, Kyle, is, you know, understand that if you weren't doing that, if they were 1099, they would have to pay that money. Like yeah. right. not, not exactly the same. But it's not like you're ripping them off. It's like, well, see, you know, all of my audience, I just, I already know how they all think. You know what I mean? There you yeah. go. I told you W2 was a bad deal. Look at that. Right off the bat, you get make 20% less. No, no, no. The salesperson now does not have to hold back that extra money to pay the government the extra self-employment tax because it's being paid as an employment tax by the employer. So the employer is paying something that they would otherwise have to pay. So let's clarify right. that. And, um, and then, and also you need to clarify, I mean, I, I was an independent for years and, right. you know, me, meeting those quarterly tax payments when you, you know, when the, when the money's coming in, you're flush and, and you, right. you know, it takes a long time to get in the, in the uh, mindset of taking that 20% out of every residual right. check and putting it in a safe account right. to pay your taxes later. People right. generally aren't that good. I mean, some people I'm sure are good about it, but a lot of people right. aren't good about it. Right. And so you're saving them that aggravation of getting a mammoth health bill, a tax right. bill at the end of the year, right? Right. Yeah. And I, and I love the other point that you made was, you know, and that I think is so crucial to understand our industry is, you know, this is the salesperson, not the entrepreneur. Right. So there is a big difference. Right. And so right. I want to, I want to kind of shift this over to you, Katie. So as we talk about entrepreneur versus salesperson, let's talk about salary versus non-salary. So of course you can have a straight commission W2 rep. Um, or you can pay them a salary. So talk a little bit about, you know, what you've seen that's successful, what's not successful as it goes to paying a salary or not paying a salary to these W-2 reps. Yeah, absolutely. And and to the point that was just made, just because you're a good salesperson does not mean that you're a good business owner, um, nor are you an entrepreneur, right? And there, right. that's why there is value in sometimes seeking a W-2 employment position as a salesperson as it gives you some structure and it gives you some resources that in the right environment you're going to sell amazingly but you can't create that environment for yourself all the time um so yeah. when it comes to salary versus no salary i think that what i can probably speak to even better is low salary versus high salary sure. and we did a few compensation models with our w-2 employees just because we do offer a base salary and historically we had let the sales agent control how much their salary was because it directly impacts how much they have to sell every month. And we have a specific factor and an equation behind that. What separates us from other sales orgs is that we actually are very transparent with what that equation is because we want our sales folks to understand why we're asking them to produce X when they get paid Y. Um, we have been more successful with paying our W-2 sales employees a smaller base salary with a faster ramp up on lifetime residuals or top line earnings versus starting them off at a high base like 70 or 80,000 
because it makes the mark so hard for them to hit. They just never feel like they get ahead. They don't get to commission out as quickly. Um, so, you know, I think that there's a lot of success in offering a salary that gives them an attainable quota so that they sales mentality wise feel like they're always going over the mark. They can commission themselves out. Their, their way of increasing their year over year salary is by overproducing and creating residual income and closing more deals. That's really our sales mentality here is, you know, you have a steady and consistent base structure that we have contract with, but we want sales entrepreneurs that need that steady base pay, but they also want to close a deal and go, I just gave myself a $4,000 raise next year because we priced this appropriately. And I know that I'm going to get lifetime residual income on this. Um, that's actually been really helpful in us gaining W2 merchant employees, um, merchant sales employees, excuse me, is the lifetime residual income. We have employees that are no longer in the company that were sales folks that haven't been in the company for five, six years, and we still pay them the residual income on the accounts that they brought in during their time with us. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I think, I think one of the really important things, right? I know, Patty, you have a follow-up here, but before yeah. <laughs> I get into that, I do want to just point out here that, you know, for those that maybe aren't quite as familiar with these structures, the idea here is if you're paying them a salary, 40,000, 50,000, 60,000 a year, the idea is you have to justify that, right? So as a business owner, you have this employee, you're paying them 40,000 a year. That means they have to sell X amount of, you know, credit card processing. They have to generate a certain amount of processing margin in order to cover that salary before the commission kicks in. And if they don't do that, that's kind of a fail. That's like, that's a negative. We we're losing money on you. That's not okay. And so Katie, if I think of what I hear you saying is what makes a lot of sense is if you have a little bit of a lower salary there, it does give them some money to get started, but the amount of margin or new accounts they have to generate to cover that salary is reasonable. And then they start moving into that residual and that extra commission territory. Is that kind of what you're saying? That's absolutely what I'm saying. And we are on our fifth bank employee right now. And when I say bank employee, right, a lot of our W-2 sales folks are bank relationship managers because sure. we specialize in bank partnerships. Right. We are on our absolutely fifth bank RM right now that started at a $40,000 base salary and is well over six figures within two and a half years of being with us and managing those banks or a bank. Right. So that's really how we go out and we, you know, find folks to work for us too, is that, yeah, this is a smaller salary, but we have a great lead source for you. Right. You need to be a good partner right. manager. And we right. have successfully shown each time that there is, and it's not just six figures, it's well over six figures. And mm -hmm. sure, if they went out and went direct as a 1099 to build that book, to give that return you and I both know it. Sometimes it takes five, six, seven five, six years, years to get yeah. that high on the right. residuals of 1099. Yeah, sure. Can we, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to drill down a little bit on, on the uh, commission model. And I think, you know, either one of you can answer this obviously, but you know, sure. we, there's a lot of different models out there. You know, can you give, give me some, give our audience some thoughts on the various types of commission that should be paid, say to a, salaried uh, W-2 versus a straight commission W-2. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll jump in and do that one. So only only previous comment I have on that on that previous question was the IRS just established a legal minimum for your salary. So the lowest you're allowed to go is $36,000. If it's commission, non-commission, you have to pay them a minimum of $36,000. So if they don't hit their commission number, you can't be like, well, you only made $300 this week in your salary. It's like, no, you legally have to pay the equivalent of that. So that's something to also keep in mind that, you know, yes, commissions make sense, but you always have to hit that legal minimum. And even if like previous month they did a $10,000 commission and this month they're only gonna be up for $2,000, you're still, the Department of Labor comes in there, they'll look at that and go, mm, technically, no, you're not hitting your minimums. So something to keep in mind with a commission versus just a straight salary, we, we chose, straight salary because of the IRS and Department of Labor 
issues. So mm -hmm. just as a heads up on that, that was something that actually yeah. just kicked up from 32 to 36 two years ago. So yeah. we actually had agents, we had to up their salary because they were on that lowest base. Um, so on the structures, um, so lots of structures out there. Um, you know, uh, Heartland was one of the first ones who did a big upfront with ongoing residuals. Um, we actually modeled a lot of our stuff around the old Heartland model. Um, you know, they would give you a, a multiple of your monthly net margin. So you would take 20 basis points times $100,000 in volume times 12 or times 10 or times 14. So you create that upfront model. So you go, okay, where do I want to break even on the upfront? And then you'll give them a piece of residual ongoing. Okay. So the math there is always going to be my upfront cost, my ongoing cost, and then what's left is what the company has to operate on. Um, you know, you're always kind of looking at that. Now, granted, the upfront is going to cost your pocket today, but once you get past that payoff time, so say you give them a 12 X, 12 X is the most common. So you give them 12 months up front. Once you hit 12 months, you've already paid off what you gave them up front. And then now say you have Matt 15%, 20% ongoing. Now you got them at a, at a, you know, lifetime residual account on that. So you as a business year one, say you gave them. So what we do here is we give them, we give them basically the net margin up front. So if it's a 15% agent with 85% up front, that's what counts towards their quota. Okay, so in year one, we make $0 on the account. And then in year two, we make 85%. Um, so for us, that model has worked. It lets them quickly ramp up, lets them hit their numbers. And for MPI, it helps us grow because we've got a larger margin over time um, to then grow our support staff or grow our teams here so we can continue to grow the company versus, you know, again, some of the other models that are out there are, well, we're going to give you 50% upfront annual and say 50% ongoing. So again, same kind of model, but now you've got a you know long long term less margin, but short term less upfront cost. Um, so that's the most common. Um, the other ones I've seen out there are people who like pay out commissions weekly, and it's a bunch of money upfront on leases or on terminals or on whatever. So that's another more common model you see um, mm -hmm. in some of those you know pop up ISOs. They're using leasing as a funding option, and then they're going on board with something else. Um, that's more the commission model. Um, and then you do have the ones that are going to go ahead and do a straight residual. They're going to say, hey, I'm going to pay a 50% residual, but I'm going to let you do a draw. So basically, they're going to give them the base salary, and then the 50%, they're going to go ahead and apply, but basically the, the draw will go up. So say 36000 is the base, we're going to say $3,000 a month. You know, okay, your first residual paycheck is $100. Now it's $300. Now it's $800. So they'll just basically have a bank with the ISO. And then that 50% part will let it draw down over time. I don't love that model because it puts all the onus on the ISO to front the money for the salary. And if you have a non-performer, yeah, when they leave, you get to capture their residuals, but hopefully it's enough to let you recoup that original nut. Um, I have seen that a lot. Um, and yeah. I've seen that be successful with some ISOs, but again, that's, that's you trusting the employee implicitly. So those are the most common models I see on the W2 side. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's an interesting one too. The draw I've seen, yeah, definitely with the draw, you need to have a amount up front that you're willing to lose. Yeah, and uh, make sure you hold to that. It's like it's not an unlimited draw, you know. Yeah, you can you're gonna draw your salary until I've right. lost ten grand, and then you're done, uh, and then I'm gonna get paid back. So, um, so yeah, that's uh, that's really good. Um, so Katie, let's go back to you, and um, you know, let's zoom out again a little bit here. So why would we go through all this? You know, like, okay, we have to, all these different structures and everything. It's like, well, I could just do 1099 straight commission. You know, I could just be done with it. And so we've talked about the bank referral and that concept of needing a little more accountability and more structure. Um, let's talk about it though, from your perspective as, you know, kind of the manager, but then also that salesperson. I mean, as a W2 rep, what are they getting out of this? So give us a little more context of like, in your opinion, why would we go down this path of W2 versus 1099? Oh, absolutely. Right. So um, I can say from a sales agent perspective um, that it, it makes sense to go W-2 versus 1099 um, if you're engaging with either an ISO or you're looking for employment. Right. Let's talk about that perspective because there's two perspectives to it. There's right. the sales agent's perspective. And then there's why you as an ISO, maybe right. you're 1099 ISO and you're thinking about bringing somebody on. Right. So as, as the employee, you know, you might want structure, you might want stability, you might want a little more work-life balance, you might be really good at closing merchant deals, but you're absolutely 
terrible at finding pipeline, right? And and there's some people out there that are just yeah. outstanding closers, but but finding that new business is just so difficult. Or maybe you've saturated an area that you're in and you need help getting into a different geographical area that's maybe 30 minutes away. Um, W-2 sales gives you a lot of structure. When you need a slick to sell something, there's a support in place where there's usually a marketing person or uh, somebody administratively that can help develop collateral for you. Um, you get a lot of benefits and, and resources if you partner as a W-2 salesperson for the right company. Just make sure that in that effort to maybe stabilize your income or create some work-life balance or get some additional resources that you need, that you really read that contract, right? Because you want to make sure that if if residual income is a part of that W-2 employment, make sure you really read, is that something that's going to survive you working there? Do you get paid that afterwards? What happens if, if there's a true up? Is there a true up system? If it overperforms in a year, do you get additional benefits for something overproducing. Um, so really just make sure you read your schedules and your agreements as a W-2 person, the way that you would want um, to see that as a 1099 person. Yeah. And looking at it from the ISO perspective, I think Kyle is probably a really good example of why you'd want to even add the, uh, the headache, right? You think to yourself, here's this headache. I've got payroll taxes now and I've got to create stuff for people. Kyle's a really good example of why the W-2 employment opportunity made sense for him because he's an outstanding salesperson. And he somehow landed this bank, which I still can't believe he did at that point in his career. He lands this bank and then he's got to hire his buddy and they've got to keep the lights on. And they're out there just crushing and selling. And for a two-man sales operation, I mean, just right. quickly outgrew their ability to service and sell at the same time. And so allowing you to get a W-2 salesperson on staff to help them facilitate with some of the additional support items that pop up from selling past your means um, and then having that person shadow and learn the industry that way and then be a sales supplement that really helps you grow your ISO. You know, if you're a one or two man group and you're okay with maybe having an in and out every year of maintaining that book and maybe a 5% growth every year, maybe it doesn't make sense. But if you're looking to grow your ISO or you need to stabilize servicing the accounts that you just onboarded quickly, it makes sense to bring on a W-2 salesperson so that you can control that experience and make sure your sales and the sales support associated with those sales can meet your goals as well. That's, that's a really important point. I'd like to, if you don't mind, guys, I'd like to just diverge a little bit and talk about benefits. You know, do you believe in, you know, offering health insurance, some of those other benefits that a lot of other W-2 type jobs um, come with? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the most successful, I'd call them a super ISO now, they're getting pretty large, but one of the most successful ISOs out there um, went with benefits as kind of their core right. um, for the W-2 sales team. Um, they were covering like 90% of the health, health costs, including dependents, including spouses, Big stuff deal. like that. So they were actually out there attracting true entrepreneurs, sure. you know what I mean? People who are right. really feeling the street because those entrepreneurs maybe were a bookkeeper on the side or, or a husband or wife was an entrepreneur. Like, And so they knew that that cost of health benefits was such a huge portion of their right. overhead that they would work with that ISO and sell for that ISO and meet that ISO's minimums. So then go ahead and get that health benefit. You know what right. I mean? So, um, you know, depending on your age, depending on how many kids you have, depending on if your spouse is working for, you know, a good state job and you can, you know, jump on her oh, benefits no. or his sure. benefits, you know what I mean? Great. But, right. you know, not everybody has that opportunity. So yeah, health benefits is an important piece. It's great for retention. It's great for stickiness. Um, now in our world, we build those into our quota factor. <laughs> you know what I mean, so okay. if we know that health benefits cost us X, you know, for that employee that is thrown on their numbers. Again, transparency in our world, mm -hmm. but we go, okay, our cost health insurance is this, we'll cover it. It'll still be a pre-tax deduction for you. So they get the 18% benefit now, right? but they've got to bring in more business to cover it. So sure. we believe in that. Um, the other ones are great too. Your, your 401k match barely costs your company anything. Um, it's a no brainer. 
give them an option for retirement, give them an option to defer their taxes, especially your bigger agents, like they're making over six figures. They can reduce their tax liability by putting money into that. You can reduce the tax liability on your side. Um, that one's a no brainer. Um, and then also think about other benefits that you don't normally kind of hear about that these, these guys go 1099 company car with gas or sure. um, something along those lines where it's, it's very simple. You can do the lease, you can deduct it off, off top, you can build it into their factor so they have to still mm -hmm. pay for it. But again, that's now a pre-tax benefit that that sales rep has, um, you know, that that they wouldn't have had if they, they were driving their own car and submitting mileage at the end of the year. You know, again, intrinsic benefits. Um, and I would say one of the things we don't do it anymore, but like we would do stuff like pick your car. Like if you really want a flashy, nice looking car, great, we'll put it in there. I'm gonna put that seven, $800 a month lease into your quota, but that's what you wanna drive and feel special? Cool, that's a benefit we can do for you because it's pre-tax and I'm gonna get that money out of either way. So, so any yeah. of those things you can do are, are very helpful to maintain stickiness. And also, oh, if I leave, I'm gonna lose that nice car <laughs> that I have. If I leave, I'm gonna lose, you know what I mean? So you yeah. gotta, you gotta make sure those W-2 agents see some value or at least perceive value because ultimately they're still salespeople and salespeople are like, what's next for me? You know what I mean? That's right, what makes sure. them salespeople. And what about like even picking and choosing? I mean, you mentioned a moment ago, like, you know, let's say your spouse has a great government job, gets great healthcare benefits. You know, I just envision somebody saying, well, I don't need healthcare, but I'd certainly like the car, you know? Yeah. Um, is there that kind of switching on yeah. off available? Yeah, so for us, that's what we do. We, you know, okay. they have, they have a line item for everything on their quota, uh -huh. and then we just have, we multiply the factor, which are overhead costs times salary plus benefits times factor equals annual revenue. You got to bring okay. it. So okay. we'll put any you want to make up a benefit, right. we'll put it in there. It's just for it's us. Free and ice for, cream you know, on Fridays or <laughs> right. exactly yeah. pizza day. I don't know. Right. I'll put any benefit on there. We're well, yeah, and, it, and and I think you know cause you brought up so many things, Kyle, that I'd love to dig into. Unfortunately, we don't have like an hour, but I'd love to talk about you because it's like so interesting to me that you know top salespeople are so interesting, and I know because I'm a top salesperson. <laughs> And we are just a pain in the neck. You know, there's no doubt about it. You know, I have I have hired a team of people around me to deal with the fact that I'm a pain in the neck. Um, other top salespeople, that's not their vision. They're not the entrepreneur, as we've talked about, right? But they're going to be a pain in the neck as well. And they just don't want to take care of all this stuff. It's like they want to drive a really nice car, to your point. You know, they just want everything taken care of for them. They know that they're really good at making money. That's like my, you know, I, I talk about this all the time with my team and, and my wife. You know, it's like, I don't know what's going on. I just, I know I'm really, really good at making money. And then like, let me just hire some people and like, give me a financial report once a week. Let's look at that together. Um, I have my assistant and every day, like literally this morning I got up and I looked at my phone to see what I was going to do today. I had no idea, like absolutely none. I woke up this morning and I'm like, I don't even know if I'm traveling. I don't have a clue. I'm just going to pull up my phone. My assistant runs my life. You know, like that's how, you know, the best salespeople are. And so unfortunately for a lot of people, if you don't have the ability to, you know, you need W-2 employees in your life. If you're a top performer, I don't care. You know, yeah. if you're a top salesperson, you need W-2 employees in your life. There's two different ways you can structure it. You can hire W-2 employees if you're an entrepreneur. And if that's your passion is to help people grow and to see that side, or you can become a W-2 salesperson and you can go to a company like what you're talking about. And these tax benefits are, are awesome, right? So it's like, it's still ultimately their money that they're spending on the lease on this vehicle, but it's like, because it's a company car, they don't have to spend the 30% income tax, you know, before they get to put the, you know, buy the car. So they get the car and all that. So I think, uh, I think this is so crucial. And I think, you know, Katie, let's go back to you for kind of this last, you know, kind of big picture question. So as we've talked about all this and as we bring this conversation to a close, there may be ISO owners, uh, agents that are saying, yeah, you know, I, maybe I do need some W2 employees in my life, right? What's your advice to them? I mean, what steps do they take? They're at that early phase. You know, they're like, I don't even know where, where, do, I, where do I start? Like, give us some ideas of your advice to them of like, how should they proceed and how should they move forward when they realize whether they need W2 people in their life for, uh, you know, a sales role, they, maybe they even need administrative type stuff, but they want to start building W2. What's your advice to them? What do they do? Um, that's a really good question. And I think that it's, it's, you need to ask yourself some really simple questions, right? Am I missing out on sales or business opportunities because I'm too busy, right? Yep. If that's a yes, that's usually a pretty good sign that you need some help, right? right. If you're missing an opportunity to sell your merchants or retain merchants because you're too busy, that's a good sign 
that you need to think about creating some structure for your ISO, because at some point you really need to sit down and go, what am I doing? Am I building this book of business and am I going to flip it in three to four years and start a new book of business and flip it in three to four years? Or is this an ISO that, you know what, I want this to be the next 15 to 20 years of my life. I've got young children and I want to like work this through until they go to college and then maybe retire. Or maybe I want to spend the next 15 years doing this because I have the freedom to do it. I'm not attached to anyone, right? If you want to grow your ISO and it's just you and one other person and you guys are consistently starting to miss your, your sales goals or your service goals or your growth goals because you're just hair, tooth and nail from 630 in the morning to 1030 at night, right? I, I tell our sales folks too, every once in a while, if you're up working late, I know I'm that guy that works at 330 in the morning because I have young children and that's when I can work sometimes, you know, send an external email after eight every once in a while. But if you're always sending out emails at some crazy time at night, people are going to go, does this person even have time for me? Even if you're mm -hmm. not doing anything wrong. Right. And that can turn people off from doing business yep. with you or continuing mm -hmm. to do business. So I think, I think it's important. Are you missing out on sales opportunities? Are you missing out on your service goals? And are you missing out on the ability to grow if that's your growth goal? I think if you ask yourself those three questions and you find yourself missing out on those things, it's time to start talking to other folks. And Kyle and I are huge believers in making friends with other people in the industry that are doing the same thing that you're yep. doing, or maybe are a few steps ahead of you to go, mm -hmm. hey, what are you doing right now? How did you get to where you are? Because we as all payment professionals, this isn't, in my opinion, the good old days of payments where everybody just kept it to themselves. We're payments professionals. We should be talking to each other. We should be sharing about how we built our ISOs or how we made that decision so that you can get some peer-to-peer -peer level advice on what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And James, yeah. to your point, right? You just said your assistant runs your life. Because you're a, you're a fantastic salesperson. You're just go, go, go. I always joke that even after 15 years of working with Kyle, I'm still his Betty because we'll still be in meetings. And that's probably why he keeps me around is <laughs> while I may be mouthy, I do create structure for him from those admin and support right. days where we'll be on, we'll be on meetings and he'll go, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll have a meeting about this sometime next week. And I'm already bringing it up and I'm like, right. You're like scheduling a it. meeting. Right. And you know, it's, it's just yeah. creating yeah. that teamwork environment because right. you want to structure. Yeah. 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 You know, it's funny. I, yeah. I think I thought of a great rule of thumb is a final thought here. Just scary. My rule of thumb, I think is going to be if you're losing sales and opportunities because you're too busy, hire some W2s. If you're losing sales and opportunities because you're too lazy, become a W-2. <laughs> you know I mean? Great idea. Yeah, Great. It's like That's so many salespeople I talk to. It's like, I know I could sell so much if I could just get up off the couch and go prospecting. You need a manager. <laughs> you know what I mean? For people like me and Kyle, it's like, you know, when you get to this point where you're like, oh, I'm dropping balls here because I'm just, go, you know, 60, 70 hours a week and I still can't get it all done. You need to hire some people. Um, and so I, I think that's really good. So Kyle, uh, let's go back to you real quick at the end here. Just give us some information on MPI. I know we just talked a few weeks ago, but for those in our audience that say, hey, that, that sounds great. I'd love to network with MPI or I'd love to talk to them about a sales opportunity or get some information. Where would you send them to learn more? Yeah, so the email that I think, you know, Q, Katie and I are both on, it's a partner support at mpiprocessing.com or check out our website, mpiprocessing.com. Whether you want to be collaborative, like Katie said, you know, we're always open to collaborating with other ISOs talking about them, what they're doing. You know, you could always end up doing work together. You don't even realize it. Um, so reach out to us to collaborate. Reach out to us if you want to learn more about these, you know, quota structures. We're more than happy to help. Um, you know, just, again, we, we we want to be, you know, part of the industry and grow with the industry. We're in it for the long haul, like Katie said. So we want to be with, you know, collaborative with other ISOs or even agents who want to be in it for the, for the long-term residuals. Love it. And that uh, email address you said was partner support at mpiprocessing.com. Right? It. Awesome. Hey, guys, thank you so much, Katie. Uh, Kyle, thank you so much for joining us and sharing this great information. Yeah, this has been really helpful. Thank it's you my guys. pleasure. Thanks for having us.
Todd, you know what? I just want to take this opportunity in, in the podcast to just say how much I really appreciate NMI. Um, literally today, just today, before we recorded, I talked to two different companies, both of them ISVs, mm-hmm. meaning they're software, you know, independent software vendors, right. and they were looking for, you know, they want to get into payments. And, right. you know, they had two choices. They could go with Stripe or they could work with a particular processing company. And I was able to get them to a processing company in our industry because of NMI, because really, you know, you need a viable gateway that can compete with Stripe in terms of ease. And so as we move into this next phase of payments, it's all about payment integration, having a technology provider like NMI that's processor agnostic, that only works with our industry to build these relationships absolutely crucial and 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 the really strong support for omni channel i mean not just yes. omni channel as a as a catchphrase but can really support it and yes. uh you know nmi is 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 hands above everybody else yeah awesome so head over to ccsalespro.com slash nmi if you have not done so already ccsalespro.com slash nmi and fill out the form there um and uh, reach out to uh, nmi and talk to them about the products and services that they have to offer And now, here is Questions from the Field with James Shepard. I wanted to talk in the questions from the field about, you know, what to do about PACs as a sales professional, right? Um, Right. And so I want to cover, you know, a couple of different things. You know, number one, I think it's important for salespeople to think through worst case scenario. So understand, you know, as you mentioned in the Insiders Report, there are millions, tens of millions of PACs devices around the world that have been deployed. This is at a time when there is an extreme chip shortage. Right. Right. Um, I want to make sure that everyone understands that the likelihood of a recall of the physical hardware of the PAX devices, I can't even imagine that possibility. Um, definitely not based on what has been said so far. It seems right. like something in the packets of data that have been sent and received is in some way suspicious to someone, whether that ends up being true or a problem or whatever. Right. What's going to actually happen is one of several things. Most likely, um, nothing is going to happen. That's my guess. Right. That's my guess. The, the second possibility is that they were hacked in some way or a rogue employee was doing something or who knows, right? Some mm-hmm. weird thing of this nature. If they were hacked from the outside, that sort of thing, they're going to have a massive, you know, pro, you know, software update that's going to secure the devices, blah, 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 right? Problem right. solved. We move on. Um, and the third and w- absolute worst case scenario, in my opinion, is they've actually been seriously compromised. All the rumors about, you know, it's China's using PAX devices in America right. for whatever. Okay, maybe. Maybe. If that's the case. Look at what happened with TikTok. And I think you have a pretty good idea of, of what's happening. Yeah. And TikTok wasn't even in that situation. But the idea would be um, it will become that that PAX, you know, international will sell to PAX United States, a new entity right. That will right. be owned by United States investors and the PAX Corporation will sell the United States version to uh, local and then they'll take over and they'll be able to ensure that nothing nefarious is happening because the Chinese side no longer has any right. connection to this new U.S. entity that was created for PAX U.S. Um, so, first yeah, of all, as far as I think, good. too, you know, James, just to interject, if you don't mind, you know, there's lots of conspiracy theories out there, but I just don't see the you know, China trying to infiltrate the U.S. POS market. But if that is the case and that becomes a real concern, I think what you suggest is very likely to be the case. They'll just right. spin it off. They'll just spin it off. And and they already have, the, they, they dominate the U.S. POS market, right. right? Like there's no need to infiltrate. They already won. So right. anyway, um, now again, uh, obviously the security concerns, I understand that I'm sensitive to that. But if that's the case, I still, there, there's no nothing I'm seeing that's like, we're going to have to melt down all the PAX terminals. Right. And I was like, no, like that's not really going to happen. So anyway, that's number one. So then that's the, that's the reality. As far as the perception, what do you do about it? Um, you know, I think there's several things depending on your level of moral uh, absolutism. Um, mm-hmm. Will there be sales reps out there talking to your merchants and saying, oh my goodness, you have a PAX device. You are oh at my risk. Goodness, you must get rid of it. Yes. Yes. Right. So be aware of that, you know, mm-hmm. you need to reach out to your merchants and, and, you know, you should have a statement <laughs> to mm-hmm. your merchants that say, you may see some things about PAX, you know, devices. Here's the, here's the facts that we have before us. We see right. no reason to take action whatsoever. We have no, in, you know, no evidence that anything's been compromised, blah, 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 blah. 
You right. need to do that because, you know, believe me, I'm connected with a lot of agents and there are a lot of agents that are going to be going out there looking for those PAX devices and saying, oh, you have a PAX device. That's not still plugged in, is it? <laughs> you know, look at this news right. story. Oh, so I, I've heard agents say that. Oh, I'm going to go out and I'm going to, you know, ups, I'm going to sure. you know, call on every PAX merchant in my sure. market. And, you know, you really need to be proactive if you have sure. those devices out there with sure. your emergency. Now, I'm not going to comment on whether or not I would do that or whether or not you should do that. I'll leave that to right. your to your moral that's compass. Right. Um, you know, I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. But anyway, so uh, that's that's a reality. And then the other thing is, you know, should you continue selling it? Um, well, you know. Again, I think that's almost a moot point because they've had such a bad chip shortage that they already Doesn't can't get matter, the terminals right? anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. My last point would be, I think this is a real windfall for these other companies. Specifically, I think Valor Paytech, our previous podcast sponsor, mm -hmm. um, I've done a lot of work with them and, and worked with them early on. This could not be better for them. So I think a lot of people are moving over to like PAX and even, you know, going, I mean, not PAX, uh, Valor Paytech. And then they're, you know, going to other platforms. Uh, this will be a huge win for Verifone, which has really struggled. You know, my thought was maybe it was Verifone that planted that seed. You know, you know? that was actually a thought that I, I wasn't going to say that, but <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you did. Not, it's not like, a real hmm. accusation, but it's like, you know, if I was no, there, it's, it's you know, and my moral compass was off a little bit, I might be thinking about that. Um, right. So, right. you know, they've really struggled in, their, in recent years. So, you know, we'll see. But anyway, I think that's the reality of the situation. Um, and so I think you do need to be aware of it as an agent. You need to be following along. Make sure you're ready to communicate it, uh, you know, with the merchants as they get, you know, attacked by your competitors. Uh, this, this is a, this is a vulnerability, whether or not it's a legitimate one, who knows, but it is a vulnerability from a marketing and sales perspective. So just be aware of it. Good stuff, James. Thanks. This is the Insider's Report with Patty Murphy. So, you know, James, there's been a lot of rum rumblings online throughout the industry about PACs in recent yes. weeks. And I wanted to catch folks up to, today on what's uh, going on. And this recording is on the 3rd of November, just in case you want to, yeah. you know. I'm sure it will be a will developing be, story. Yes, it, it could, it's definitely a developing story. But in late October, the Florida offices of PAX Technology were raided by the FBI. Um, and just as a reminder, PAX's corporate headquarters are in Shenzhen, Shen, Shenzhen, China. I think that's how you I pronounce it. I think you did it. perfectly there. <laughs> Thank you. Now, the FBI said that the search was related to an active federal investigation and included agents from a veritable alphabet soup of law enforcement agencies, including Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection, Naval Criminal Investigation Service, and the Jacksonville, Florida Sheriff's Office. But beyond that, it wasn't saying anything. At about the same time, Krebs on Security, which is a cybersecurity website, reported that it had learned from a trusted source, as it called it, that an investigation of PACs had been launched after a major U.S. payment processing company raised the issue of unusual network packets originating from PACs terminals. Now, according to Krebs' source, the processor suspected PACs terminals were being used both as malware droppers or a repository of, of malicious files and as a command and control um, locations for staging attacks and collecting information. The source told Krebs that the packet sizes didn't match the payment data that should have been sending, nor did it appear to be the case of software updates. Um, and inquiries to the customer didn't result in satisfactory answers. Now, shortly after that, Bloomberg News reported that WorldPay had begun replacing its PAX terminals, sh swapping them out for Ingenical and Verifone devices. And it cited messages it had reviewed between WorldPay and one of its partner firms. Now, I reached out to PAX in light of all this reporting, and in a statement, the company said it was not aware of any illegal conduct by it or its employees. The company also said it was aware of media reports regarding the security of PAX devices and services, and said, quote, PAX technology takes security very seriously. As always, PAX Technology is actively monitoring its environment for possible threats. We remain committed to providing secure and quality software systems and solutions. Now, PAX, just you know, as background, has about 57 million POS devices in, at merchant locations in about 120 countries. Um, it's not known how many or which of these terminals are suspected of being compromised. And of course, you know, they have probably like three different, diff three dozen lines of term, you know, th three dozen different types of terminals, right. you know, from the very basic to the smartest. Right. Now, um, 
subsequent to my getting that message from PAX in, in, U, in, in PAX's U.S. offices, the board of directors in China um, also addressed the Krebs reporting, saying it was based on secondhand hearsay, which they're right. And it also pointed out that PAX products are subject to PCI security standards and all the relevant laws and regulations in the countries where the, com where the company operates. It said, quote, similar to other reputable industry peers, uh, PAX has always taken and continues to proactively take the initiative to enhance security standards of its products, both generally and in collaborations with its customers and external third-party test laboratories. Uh, to carry out product certification, software penetration testing, and other stringent security-related controls, and where appropriate, carry out necessary fixes and mitigating measures. Um, as far as the bo board is aware, based on due, due diligence and inquiries, as of the date of this announcement, which was uh, November 1st, I believe, actually, no, excuse me, it was the 29th of um, October, okay. there are neither been any reported cyber attack incidents nor cyber attack complaints, including any breach of security protocols against PAX products and services anywhere in the world, end quote. Um, it further explained in, the, in that statement that data packets transmitted by PAX devices typically include more than just payment data. You know, they have data connected to apps installed on the terminals, especially right. geolocation and loyalty programs, online ordering, all of these can be data intensive, right. um, as well as telemetry data related to data memory usage. Packet sizes uh, can differ between terminals and in different markets and may require communicating geolocation data to third party IP addresses, which could be outside the country, <coughs> excuse me, where a device is operational. As for WorldPay, uh, both the U.S. and U.K. arms of the country company had discontinued uh, deployment of PAX devices beginning in early October, and PAX said this is a very small percentage of their total deployments. So that's where we stand right now. Um, you know, my gut reaction is you're not going to see mass exodus, exodus away from PAX terminals this close to the year and holidays. Um, and, you know, and, and that's the thing about these FBI investigations. It could be nothing. It could be a whole lot of something. Right. But we won't know for quite a while. We won't know for a while. But I will keep tabs on it and, uh, you know, yeah. update us as necessary. Good stuff, Patty. Thanks for the update. Sure thing. Thank you for listening to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Whether you are an industry veteran, processing executive, or just trying to learn about the payment space, we appreciate your time. The Merchant Sales Podcast is a joint production of Greensheet.com and CCSalesPro.com, and we hope you will tune in next week for more information and tips on building your merchant services business.